Seahawks, episode 260 of the Seahawkers podcast. I'm Brandon Schultz of the Military Seahawkers. And joining me, my good buddy and Montana Seahawker, Adam Emmert. Hey, buddy. And uh, happy late anniversary. I think it's right around now. No, I think we... Like you, two weeks ago. It was like two weeks ago, and, and it was one of the previous episodes where you got mad at me for missing it. And, no, no, uh, I got mad at you for missing it. It hadn't happened yet, and now we both missed it, and so I'm bringing it up first, so I'm the good one. Okay. See how that works? I already thought that we resolved the fact that one of us missed it, and I just... Now yeah, that I know, you, now because you don't care about again. my feelings. <laughs> yeah, that's it, yeah. I know. I, I took my our anniversary trip to Orlando, and you stood me up, so I, I don't know who's worse in this situation. Oh, that'd be me. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> you win that one. <laughs> but uh, speaking of wins, Seahawks come away with a win here in uh, preseason week three. That was kind of fun. Yeah, 23 to 15 over the Chargers. The Seahawks go to two and one. We send those dirty L.A. Chargers to 0 and three. So, you know, Chargers fans can maybe have an 0 and four preseason uh, like we did last year. And maybe that gives them hope toward the playoffs. Did you say Chargers fans like there's some? Well, there's I it, mean, you noticed the empty stadium that was, uh, you know, just basically full of like traveling Seahawks fans that yeah. were you know, drowning out their offense in the first quarter. I assume that at least two of the parents of players on the team Mm -hmm. uh, are fans of the team, which would make it Chargers fans plural. Well, what if they're just a fan of their son player and not the team? You, You still have to be a fan of the team. I don't know. It's kind of a new age in sports. Like you see all like in the NBA, for example, with all the players moving. Like it used to be like in the NBA, you know, people were fans of like a team yeah. and like those were your guys because they stuck with your team for like 10 years. Now they all move around year to year and you listen to a lot of these young millennial fans and they're just like, no, I just like Paul George and I just root for him wherever he goes. Yeah. Like they're not really a fan of a team. They're a fan of individual players. Maybe that's how they, these parents do it because clearly nobody's showing up to the games there. <laughs> Seahawks fans were there. I could tell that they were there. Yeah, that was funny. It was a good game. I have some conflicts with this game and I want to get into it, but I want to start off with maybe some of the bigger news that's going on that's outside of the game, because I feel like this Jadavion Clowney trade talk is heating up over the fact that there was the report that came out uh, on Monday this week or Tuesday. What day is it today? One of, one of the days. Yep. <laughs> because there was a report that came out this week that Jadavion Clowney was going to Miami to talk to them, but he's not really interested in Miami. He's more interested in going to the Seahawks or the Eagles. So Clowney's a fan of the bird teams. Yeah. Well, he's also uh, apparently a fan of winning. That's a big difference there between, you know, the, the, you'd say the dirty chargers. How about the dirty dolphins? That's That's, pretty bad. That franchise, the one that, yeah, a lot of sports hate. When I first heard that Clowney was going to make a visit to Miami and was considering the Dolphins as a potential destination, mm-hmm. this set off red flags for me. If he's interested in playing for the Dolphins, that's no bueno. Yeah, there's something wrong with him. That's a character problem, right? right? If he actually wants to go to Miami. Yeah. But the thing is, why would Houston trade within the conference? Like, if you're the, if you're the Houston Texans, wouldn't you rather trade him outside of your conference? Oh, yeah, I suppose, because you don't want to. I mean, Miami would be okay because, you know, you're not going to see him in the playoffs. Well, you never know. Maybe the the, the, you know, new head coach down there would get some turned around. You know, I mean, there's possibility. What if Fitzmagic has like one last amazing season, you know, and he just beards his way all the way to the playoffs? You never know. There's three other teams in the East that I could pick to finish above. The Dolphins this year. Yeah, that's how the math works. Yeah, you're right. (laughs) Every one of the uh, other teams in the AFC is. Yeah, yeah. I could pick that too. And I would. But do you think that helps a trade him being more interested personally in the Seahawks or the Eagles uh, for us? Yeah, and I'll tell you why that is, because he hasn't signed his franchise tag tender yet, which means he's a player that's not actually under contract. So if he tells the Texans, you know, you can set up a trade for anywhere you want, but I'm not going to go there until halfway through the season until I have to sign my tender to accrue that time for the season. And that's what we saw from Dwayne Brown when he got traded from the Texans. He waited around until midseason until he had to come in to actually accrue that season to become a, a free agent at the end of the season. And so I do think Clowney has some leverage in this scenario to say to, to at least get to dictate a little bit toward where he may or may not want to go. 
Yeah, that is definitely true. And then you get the report that comes out just the other day as well that he's fired his longtime agent. Right. And is hiring somebody new. It, maybe he's unhappy with the way his agent has handled the process as far as getting a trade done now so he can you know get to a team, start to contribute, get paid by said new team. Yeah. Like, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I don't know what the Eagles cap space looks like in comparison to the Seahawks, but if I remember correctly, we have more cap space. So as far as once a trade is completed, us being able to actually give him a deal, it feels like we would have a better opportunity to do that than say somebody like the Philadelphia Eagles. Well, and part of the problem in this scenario is the fact that he missed that deadline to be able to sign a long-term contract. That's one of the questions people are bringing up with Jadavion Clowney is that you can't bring him in and sign him to a long-term deal like the Chiefs did with Frank Clark because it's past that deadline for long-term deals. So you have to, you're going to have to wait until the end of the season to actually be able to to bank something out for a long-term scenario, unless you kind of have a little bit of an agreement to where you say, "Oh yeah, if this happens, we're gonna we're gonna make it right." Those types of things that you know aren't supposed to happen, but probably happen anyway. And you brought up the agent. You know, we just saw Michael Crabtree fire his agent. And he hired the agent of Kyler Murray and Cliff Kingsbury in Arizona. And, oh, look at that. He ends up on the Arizona Cardinals. How about that? So I, they may have some tricks where they're working behind the scenes to it goes into hiring the right agent for where you want to go, I think. Yeah, that helps, too, because, I mean, it's a relationships business. And obviously, if your uh, agent is tight with the head coach and the brand new starting quarterback, like, yeah, you may end up there like Crabtree did. I'd forgotten about the deal where you can't sign a guy past the deadline. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up because that raises an interesting question, too. So he doesn't want to go and play for the Texans at uh, the franchise tag, right? So why would he want to go to another team and play for the franchise tag? Is he just pissed now? <laughs> Is he just mad at the Texans? Just like, you know what? Screw you guys. Well, there is a reason to be mad at the Texans based on the franchise tag because they run a 3-4 system. He's actually an outside linebacker. Right. And the franchise tag for an outside linebacker is less than it is for a pass rushing defensive lineman. Right. So, well, any defensive lineman, really, because they, they lump them all in together. Right. So mm -hmm. it, it's similar to the Jimmy Graham scenario. They wanted to franchise him as a tight end. Jimmy Graham's like, well, hey, I play outside as a receiver more than I play as an actual tight end. I want to be franchised as a receiver. And we saw that relationship end there because of that. Right. So I'm kind of feeling like he's looking at four, three defensive teams now to where he can go and say at the end of this season, if you want to franchise me again, now you're franchising me as a defensive lineman. And now I get a true franchise tag amount going into the next year if you want to if we want to continue to play this franchise tag game right uh in the funny thing is is like the jimmy graham part like i i was always on the side of well you're a tight end you're not a wide receiver right i know you catch a lot of passes but you're a tight end tony gonzalez didn't go into the hall of fame as a wide receiver even though he caught a zillion passes as a tight end Right. Like but it's he was very different end. for the, the pass rushing outside linebacker and a uh, pass rushing defensive end. They play the same role. It's just right. so that like that's the part where like I'm more on the side of Clowney on this one. Yeah. It's like no, number one. What number does he wear? <laughs> 90. A, right. That's a defensive lineman number. That's not a linebacker number. OK, so there's that. And then also, too, just like you said, I, there are a lot of uh, football websites and, and stats that are being tracked now. They don't classify somebody as outside linebacker or DN. They call them edge. Yeah. Edge defender. And that, I mean, that's what he is. So I, I feel like he's got more uh, legs to stand on regarding this issue than Jimmy Graham did in the past. And this is why I think it would work out well for the Seahawks, because when they traded Frank Clark to the Chiefs, there's we're going around the clowny could be had for potentially a second round pick. Hey, do and, it. <laughs> and absolutely do it if that's the case, because you traded Frank Clark for a 2019 first rounder who you used to get LJ Collier. You got a 2020 second rounder. You could turn around and send that to the Texans and get clowny. And essentially, you've traded Clark for LJ Collier. Clowney Clowney comes in with a lower salary because that franchise tag is at the linebacker franchise tag amount than mm -hmm. Frank Clark's franchise tag amount. Right. And then even if he is a quote unquote rental for one year, 
he signs a big deal and you get a third round comp pick in 2021. Right. Or you end up signing him at the end of that if he has an awesome year and you got a great edge defender <laughs> right. like out of the deal. You know, I mean, that that's the thing, a- along with Collier, who has great potential. Yeah, you can so, actually pick between Ziggy Anza and Jadavion Clowney at the end of the season and say, hey, whoever does best, we're looking at a long term deal for you. Right. So that that makes a huge difference right there. Now, I mean, it seems like the Redskins are kind of the sticking point throughout this whole process. Because we all know that the Houston Texans offensive line is a dumpster fire. (laughs) And uh, I actually feel I actually feel for the franchise because I know what that feels like. Yeah. Having a dumpster fire of an offensive line. And so what I keep hearing is they want to get Trent Williams back in a trade. But from the other articles that I've read, it sounds like the Redskins, they're not giving him up for anything less than like. I don't know, half the country's net worth. <laughs> like they keep asking, they keep asking for, you know, huge deals. Well, Trent Williams is an outstanding left tackle and there aren't a whole lot of those. I can see why after they gave up Dwayne Brown, that they, they need to fill that spot. That's been a, a vacant spot for them for a while now. I'm curious. I, I'm curious to see if they can, can swing something to make that work because that does make all the sense because skins have a problem with Trent Williams. Uh, Clowney doesn't want to play. Right. But I don't know. I suppose if you're Washington, you could absolutely use a player like Clowney too. Well, yeah, especially if he's going to play. But here's the thing: if you're if you're Clowney, that's the last franchise you want. To, well, one of the few franchises that you don't want to go to. I mean, the Redskins are the definition of dysfunction, right? With terrible ownership, and ownership matters in professional sports. And Daniel Snyder has been a train wreck the entire time that he's been there. Now, the other way you could look at it, if you're clowning, is if you go to the Redskins, you know, Snyder is going to pay. He always pays. That's true. <laughs> yeah. But and you don't have to worry about probably going to go down the toilet and you're probably not going to get another contract after that one. Correct. Yeah. And looking at the salary cap, it, it does look like the skins are just under... Well, around 11 million in cap space. But if they were to trade Trent Williams, that would obviously free up that space that's already tied to that. Right. Uh, you brought up the Eagles. Eagles and Seahawks are actually pretty comparable. Seahawks at 20 million in cap space. Eagles at 18.7. So, and I know I next year we have a crap ton. Like the way John Schneider is a magician, man, because he's <laughs> he's got to set up looking pretty good for the next few years while paying Bobby Wagner, while paying Russell Wilson. You know, it's it's pretty incredible. Well, and I think that's because you do have Jaron Reed coming up, who's going to need a payday. You're going to want to pay one of these pass rushers, whether it's Anza uh, long term or any of your other rookies that are coming toward the end of their deal. So uh, 60 million on the books for 2020 for the Seahawks. So, yes, John Schneider, the magician. Yeah, I mean, that's that's pretty amazing when you think about it. And I don't know, it'd be cool to see that trade come to fruition because Boy, watching this third week of the preseason, a lot of things to love about the way the team looked. But boy, howdy, there's one area that we'll just we're going to sit and harp on all season, it feels like. And that's pass rush or the lack thereof, at least for the first six weeks, because you've seen people put together what it would look like for a front seven if you brought in Clowney. And, you know, especially if it's Clowney, Jaron Reed, Puna Ford, Ziggy Anza. And then you have Bobby Wagner, KJ Wright, Michael Kendricks. Like, that's a pretty awesome front seven. That feels good, doesn't it? <laughs> but really, you know, if you if you sub out Clowney and, and put Cassius Marsh, it's still a pretty good front seven. It's decent. It's decent. It's not, I mean, it's yeah, it's not as good, but right. I would take it. Yeah. I mean, that's assuming the answer is going to be the, the player that we're all hoping that sure. he'll be this season. Yeah. There's there's some question marks within there. And he's back at practice this week, so that's good. But you you want to talk about the the Charger game and the Seahawks did get the win and pass rush was an issue. Uh, we've seen more uh, blitzing linebackers. Kendricks mm-hmm. had a solid game. Uh, I really liked what I saw from Michael Kendricks in this game. And yeah, not much much from the defensive line, though. No, not in terms of pass rush at, right. at all. They were very solid against the run. I think that was something that that felt good, you know, as you watch the game go on. Um, it's just it's just clear that the pass rush isn't going to be a strength of this defensive line group, or at least until Anson and Collier are back and we see what they have to, you know, add to the table. I, I think that 
they could be a huge boost. But then again, you're losing Jaron Reed for six games. So there's a, there's a lot going on there that uh, can make you nervous. Uh, but boy, the starting linebackers, what a difference does that make? You know, having them out on the field. Uh, just some of the best in the game, probably the best, uh, you know, group of linebackers in the entire NFL. And you could see it on display. Uh, DBs came out and played a lot better. I felt like in this game, um, you know, even though, uh, Shaquille got flagged for, uh, pass interference on, on one play where like, you know, he basically grazed him with a finger <laughs> as, uh, as it, the, the route was developing. Yeah. But I, you know, overall the, the defense, I felt like throughout the game really showed it, you know, exactly what they did last year and what they've done for the past couple of years. And that's a lot of the bend, but don't break kind of style. Like we're going to let you dink and dunk all day and you're going to have to string together 10, 12 plays to, to get 60, 70 yards down the field. And then when it comes time in the end zone, we're going to tighten things up and you're, you're going to have to kick field goals. And, and that's what it, that's what they did. But here's the thing. This was against Tyrod Taylor and it wasn't Philip Rivers. We had the expectation that Phil Rivers was going to be in this game and carve the Seahawks for the first half. And right. instead we got Tyrod Taylor who uh, he ran the ball all over. He looked good getting outside and running the ball, but uh, he had yeah. some nice throws. He had, he, I he mean, did. Tyrod Taylor looks like a borderline starter in this league, which he is. He is. I mean, I remember Tyrod Taylor coming into uh, the clink and tearing us up <laughs> like he was he was almost borderline unstoppable in that game i think that was his pro bowl gear but he's got a he's got a really good skill set i mean geez you know looking at the chargers in their quarterback room it's like man cardell jones looked good <laughs> easton stick the, looked good in the fourth quarter yeah so uh, you start going down their their depth chart and you're like dang they got you know some quarterbacks that can play and it, I, I think i think tyrod's one of the best backups in the league no, he's not Phil Rivers. And so, no. yeah, you didn't get that full taste of, you know, the Chargers on offense for sure. But, um, you know, I thought the defense looked solid. And, and again, we kind of got that same treatment on uh, the offensive side of the ball, you know, basically playing against a lot of their twos. I mean, no Bosa, no Ingram. Yeah. Um, you know, that makes a big difference, too. So but the, but the offensive line looked great. I mean, they just they are huge, man. <laughs> And they just they just road grade people. I love it. And Ethan Posick out there, he he plays well with that group of starters. So I you don't have that much concern going into week one if Mikey Potty can't make it. And it sounds like he may not be back in time for that week one game. And when your other starter at the guard spots, DJ Fluker, and he's had his injury issues, it is kind of nice to have that sixth offensive lineman that has that flexibility that he can play center for Britt. He can play the guard spot. So I know a lot of people were throwing around the idea of if you have to make a trade for Clowney, you know, do you throw in a guy like Ethan Posick because the the Texans do mm. need linemen? I don't I don't think I want to get rid of a lineman, whether it's Jermaine Effetti, Ethan Posick. I would I would much rather have that depth on the offensive line than having that uh, that extra pass rusher, especially when, you know, maybe the Houston Texans need a, a running back, too. And we seem to have some some depth beyond one and two now. So the Texans, their biggest struggle with offensive line is the tackles position, yeah. right? So why would you give Posick up in a trade? Like a guy who's very versatile. I mean, you could give them the, basically an offensive line hero, a man who could come in and dominate the league at left tackle in George fan <laughs> in, a, in a trade. And it, that really just solves all the issues for everybody. Yeah, it solves your issue of struggling to root for Fant over the past years. And I, I, like I see what you're doing He's there. A good dude. <laughs> you're He's trying a to get rid dude. of him. I know, but I don't need I don't need a guy who barely has played football on my team. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he's a veteran now. <laughs> sure. <laughs> All right. Well, while Adam's trying to trade George Fant, I think I'm trying to trade CJ Procise after this one solid game that he had. Oh, God. All right. So he comes. Well, first off, Carson comes in and looks awesome. Yeah. You're just like, oh, there's Chris Carson. There That's is. what yeah. he does. He does three uh, runs, 23 yards. Yeah. He breaks one off for 13 yards. Yeah. Looks yeah. fine. 
Yeah, I feel I feel great about that. And then Penny comes in and gets stuffed like multiple times. <laughs> he ran and... hard though. When he was getting stuffed, he was actually he was running hard. And he had yeah. that nice catch on the outside where he broke like four tackles, didn't quite get the into the end zone, but he ends up getting into the end zone on the next play, gets a touchdown. He also had a bunch of other catches on the outside where the first guy took him down. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like where where they keep talking, like, we love getting Rashad Penny in space, and then you get him out in space and he gets tackled by the first dude. <laughs> Except okay. for once, which is great. I mean, fine. I mean, he had he, he looked mediocre. OK, and it was like, well, he looks serviceable. That's fine. And then pro size comes in and looks freaking awesome. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't need pro size to look awesome right now. No, like this is a problem for me. I don't I can't trust you to be on the roster. But you start doing that. And I'm like, I kind of want you on the roster. <laughs> I, I haven't felt so conflicted about a player in a very long time after one preseason performance where he had like five carries. It was the most frustrating part about this game. It's like, why? Why is this not the CJ Pro size that we could have had over the, the past vision, couple the years? The jump cuts, the, you know, the power, like he looked, he looked great. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was so tough to watch. Pro size gets a touchdown in this game, has five carries, 32 yards. Seahawks have 120 plus rushing yards at halftime. Uh, the running game looked good. And a big part of that was because the offensive line as well. But, you know, the trio of Penny, Carson and Procise, it it looked pretty good. And Russell Wilson also had three runs for 31 yards. I didn't see need to see him, you know, making a dive uh, for the first down marker in a preseason game on the first drive. <laughs> yes. Well, OK, here's the thing. So that was read option, right? And I remember us last year getting very upset you know, throughout the the season that the read option was there and we never, never used it. And Russell Wilson just didn't run it. And, you know, there was some conjecture that maybe slowed down a little bit and we're just not going to run that anymore. I think the only reason that he did that here in a preseason game was to put it on tape mm. to make teams respect it throughout at least the first four or five weeks of the season before everybody goes, oh, right. They really don't do that anymore. Yeah. Uh, that's my guess. I bet you we don't see that okay. during the regular season. I, do, I like your theory on that. It's just with the the field conditions, the way they were, uh, the fact that it's a meaningless preseason game. I didn't need to see it. It, it got me <laughs> worried for one moment, but uh, then everything was fine. So that's good. Yeah. The other thing that had me a little bit worried, Jason Myers missing an extra point, but then he he redeemed himself by hitting a 58 yard field goal. Okay. Kind of. So he misses the extra point and then he trots out there at 53 yards and actually kicks it. There's a flag. It's wide, right? Yeah. And then, and then he gets another crack at it and he, you know, bangs it through at 58, which is a huge kick. Don't get me wrong. That's, that's hard to do, but he's one for three. <laughs> and that, that, that made me a little scared at that point, but you know, it, he's going to be fine. Well, he didn't pull a hammy trying to kick a 58 yard or so. <laughs> There's that. I think I think we're it's a step up from last season. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Well, another guy on special teams. We saw Amadi out there as the starter on special teams for the punt returns. He had the the muff <sighs> punt. But yeah. he does look like he's you know, maybe Tyler Lockett doesn't need to play that spot. Or maybe he does. <laughs> yeah. Ugo, you know, the first couple of punts he fielded cleanly. And didn't really do much with. And I was like, that's okay. You know, really all I need from my punt returner in this day and age is just secure the football. Yeah. Just secure the football. Be Brian and, Walters and go out there and, and fair catch it. Yeah. And then, then he dropped it. And I was like, <laughs> it, it, on the one punt that he had a, like a legit chance to, you know, bring back, like, a, a, you know, fielding it near the 50. Yeah. And, and then that's the one he muffs. And I was like, ah, oh. but he's a rookie and I think he is good at it. I mean, it seems like he was good at it in college. And just like you said, I don't need to see Tyler Lockett back there unless it's a big time situation. Tyler Lockett had a couple big time catches, two catches, 50 yards in this game, one for 30 yards at night to see him and Russell Lincoln up downfield. The other guy that Russell Wilson was Lincoln up downfield with was John or well, no, that was uh, by, I it think was Gino. By, it was Gino hooking up with John Ursua. Yeah. Uh, Ursua looked good. And that's going to be honestly, at this point, we've we've talked at nauseum of which receivers stay, which receivers go, who ends up on practice squad, who gets picked up by other teams. Da -da 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 -da. I don't even know at this point. <laughs> I mean, I, I really don't. I know. Uh, we, I, we, I know. I know at this point it's going to be Tyler Lockett. It's going to be Jerron Brown. It's going to be David Moore, even though he has a broken 
uh, arm. He's making the 53. It sounds like he'll be back. He won't need to go to IR. So mm-hmm. then you have DK Metcalf and then you have Ursua and then the sixth one doesn't matter. Right. Yeah. I, I, it's just interesting because I really like, well, I hope it's Ferguson uh, is your sixth one. Cause I, I feel like he can come in and do a decent Jerome Brown impression. He could do a decent, you know, uh, David Moore impression like mm-hmm. that. I, I feel like you, as a depth guy, I like jazz Ferguson. I like his skill set. But I, what I really do want is I do want a Sir, Ursua to be a part of the wide receiving core just because of his skill set. It is very different than everybody else. It is the closest uh, to Doug Baldwin that all the receivers have as far as skills. And I, that's that's the guy I want to see stick. I'm worried about him, though, because his name spell checks to Ursula. So I'm having I'm having flashbacks to Karen Williams. Kaysen, you know, spell check to Karen every time. Oh, okay. And so now I thought maybe you had nightmares from the little mermaid or something like, <laughs> no, no, not yet. Uh, okay. But thanks for yeah. planting that in there now. Yeah. Uh, Ursula, the sea witch. Yeah. Yeah. And he's from Hawaii. So, you know, that's from the sea. It, it does kind of fit. Yeah. yeah. So if I have to get an Ursula Jersey, I'm going to have like a closet full of jerseys with female names on them. Misspelled uh, <laughs> player names in a female version. I like this. I think this is, this could be a trend that you start. This could be, yeah. I need more people to get on board with this trend, though. I can't be the only one out there doing this. Why? Be original. That's <laughs> it. That that's amazing. You you got to rock it with confidence, dude. This is your thing. This is this is yours, Brandon, and nobody else's. Nobody else's. Well, one of the other rookies out there hoping to make the team, Travis Homer, had nine carries, twenty-seven yards. His longest was a seven-yard run, and I think he's going to make the team. I would think so. In Look, all the backs look good. J.D. McKissick even looked good. Gosh, yeah. that's a, I, I don't know what you do with that position group now. Because ProSize look good? <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> you trade them to the Texans. Okay, Texans. George Fant, C.J. ProSize. <laughs> and whatever pl- other player we can find that's always injured that has seems to have tremendous upside. And a second round pick and, and all for Clowney. And let's just make this happen. Maybe that's what you do. I don't know. Hey, do they it's, need uh, a linebacker? Because Austin Calitro looked awfully good, and we ha- we seem to have a ton of linebackers too. Uh, yeah, yeah, there's that. Here's the thing. Like, I feel like uh, Pro Size could end up being a little like James Carpenter, somebody that you spend relatively high draft capital on. You bring him in, flashes a couple times, always injured. You finally either like they let Carpenter go, didn't offer him another contract. He ends up going to the Jets, right, and then being really good for a long time and puts together like a, a string of healthy seasons all in a row. And, and I feel like that could end up being pro size. We let him go and he just ends up on another roster. Like say the Patriots, it ends up being awesome for like four years and doesn't get hurt. Like that's what, <laughs> that's how it, it just, I have that fear. You know, that reminds me of Amon green, you know, a guy who played two years in Seattle in the yeah. late nineties and then Holmgren sends him to green Bay and he, he breaks he off there, you know, five 1,000 yard rushing seasons in a row. Yeah. Pro bowler. Yeah. We don't need that. But I if I had to decide if it was me making the decision as mm-hmm. to who makes the team. Yeah. I feel like I have to go J.D. McKissick over C.J. Procise. But if <laughs> the way I think of when I hear Pete Carroll talk about C.J. Procise, I kind of think that Pete Carroll's keeping C.J. Procise. He really likes him. <laughs> I I don't know another coach that would have had this long of leash with a player <laughs> regarding his health. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I guess the, the part of it that is frustrating is it feels like J.D. McKissick, if he's hurt, he goes out there and plays. I feel like C.J. Procise doesn't go out and play unless he feels 100. And I don't think you can be that kind of player in the NFL. No. No, you need to be able to go out there and play even when you're at 85, 90. Because most 75, of the time, man, yeah, that's like, what you know most what I mean? other guys are at when they're out there. Right. I just, I don't know that he has that. I mean, maybe he does. And like, all this has just been unbelievably fluky, but man, once is a coincidence, twice is a trend, three times is you problem. We're on like 14. I know. Like, I, I don't. And then he comes out and flashes. I don't, I don't know what to do. 
Well, I don't know if the Seahawks are going to keep a fullback, but I keep listening to the press conferences and I hear the reporters asking Pete Carroll about Puna Ford playing fullback. And I want that to happen more than Nick Ballore. But uh, (laughs) does Pete Carroll have something up his sleeve that we're going to see later on? I think you probably have better odds of that than anything. Or maybe they take, you know, somebody like Hollister or Disley and use them at fullback. I, I could see that. Nice to see Uncle Will back out there. Oh, yeah. Like he he was looking good, you know. Actually, got a little bit of run in this game. Um, didn't you know? Didn't have any receptions or anything, but uh, he was out there. Hollister made a couple catches. Um, I kind of enjoy the idea of having two tight ends on the roster, one from Montana, one from Wyoming. Mm. That feels right to me. <laughs> uh, I I'd really like that. Um, but. Uh, who knows what they end up doing there when it comes down to, you know, Ed Dixon is supposedly coming back someday and Hollister, you know, early on had the drop Wilson hit him on a, a nice little seam route and he just couldn't hang on. Um, it, yeah. It, it, that's another group where good luck making decisions. I wish I could come on the podcast this week and like be declarative <laughs> and, and feel like I have like real honest opinions to give you as to who should stay and who should go. But it's such a mixed bag. Yeah, man. The 53 man roster cuts. It's, this is going to be finalized on Saturday. So you can you can sit on the fence about guys all you want. And as long as you do it through Saturday and then you can be very definitive uh, after the decisions are already made. I, I guess <laughs> I just wouldn't want to be John Schneider and Pete Carroll right now. You feel like there's a lot of guys that have the ability to play like that can really add to the team that have cool, special skill sets. And that's what they talk about looking for all the time. Guys with unique ability and being able to put them in positions for them to showcase that unique ability. And I bet you on Saturday, there's going to be a couple names that get cut that are going to be major head scratchers. I know one of them that won't, it won't be though is Gino. No, he's going to be the number two. Yeah. Unless the Seahawks decide to take whoever the chargers cast off uh, as their fourth QB. Well, and that's kind of why I brought up the chargers quarterback room is that was a excellent example of something we talked about the week prior when we were discussing backup quarterbacks is I'm not a huge fan of Gino and obviously Paxton Lynch, whatever, uh, there are a lot of teams that have better quality depth at the quarterback position. And there's going to be some guys that are released that you look at and you say, this guy is better than Gino and chargers are a great example of that. Well, and you see teams like the 49ers who do so well, carrying three quarterbacks who all can kind of play with Garoppolo, Bethard and Mullins. I don't think they're going to give up uh, any of those three guys and, and send them packing. But especially since they've been so uh, injury prone over the years among well, all the, the entire group. Jimmy's been injury prone. Yeah. The rest of them well, have been, you know, OK. I feel like Bethard's been kind of injury prone. A little bit. I mean, he's not like Jimmy G. No. Yeah. No, he, he leads the league in proneness. And he also now leads the league in scaredness. He looks just terrified to be in the pocket. Oh, now. He, did o- he did OK against the Chiefs, though. Mm. Well, the Seahawks do have some tough decisions to make with their roster spots and coming up in the game against Oakland Thursday night. I I just wonder if there's if we're going to get any more clarity as fans. I think the Seahawks, they probably mostly know they got rid of Amara Darbo going into this game and saying that they want to give him a little bit of extra time to to jump Mm -hmm. on with another team. Uh, ahead of the fourth preseason preseason game. So I, that, that's kind of cool knowing that, hey, we're not going to keep you, but go ahead and put you out there so you can, you know, put so you can at least have a few practices going into Thursday night's game, maybe for another team. Right. And yeah, it's funny that you say it's pretty cool that they just released that guy real fast. <laughs> but in, in a way, it is doing a guy a favor. Um, and it's just being real about the situation. Look, yeah. he hasn't he's done diddly squat since he's been drafted. And it, you just there, there's been nothing that he's done that looks special. And well, you talk him up too. Pete Carroll actually getting out there and saying he's going to land on another team, I think helps him out a little bit. Yeah. I mean, that's something that the Seahawks do have a reputation for is, you know, if you're not going to play here, let's try to get you somewhere where you can make a contribution and, you know, keep getting them checks. But it does make you wonder who those candidates for maybe that sixth wide receiver spot. If you're if you're locked in on Ursua being the the fifth guy, 
Mm-hmm. Then that leaves you with Gary Jennings, the fourth round pick, Malik Turner, a possibility who when I, you know, we talked about there not really being a good David Moore comp uh, in that last show. I mm. think Malik Turner might be the best uh, David Moore backup. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's that's a fair assessment there. Um, Gary Jennings had that awesome block that he got flagged for. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can't do that anymore, but it was awesome. <laughs> I think that even though you do get flagged for it, I think that's at least, you know, putting something out there for Pete to. Yeah. Well, you heard uh, Brock and Kurt Menifee, you know, on the broadcast, you know, sitting there saying, yeah, the coaching staff is really looking for those splash plays. Yeah, that was a splash play, splash play. even though it got flagged. <laughs> I mean, that showed some toughness there. So Jennings, he could find that sixth spot on the roster. And, you know, that could be one of those. Usually the six wide receiver, it doesn't it doesn't mean a whole lot for production throughout the year and it may be just a place to to stash a guy to Mm -hmm. develop similar to how David Moore developed over the years so Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm going to get anything extra out of the Oakland game in in terms of the receiver spot probably not I have a question for you do you want to see CJ Prosize have a good game or a bad game or if you've if you've already decided he's on the 53 just let him sit out this game so that you have him healthy for week one just put him in the glass case yeah Nah, you got to give him some runs. See if he can put string together two games, right? Because <laughs> he's barely been able to do that. Sure. Yeah. Because if he can't go, then you know you have to get rid of right. him. Right. Then you. Yeah. Exactly. If I read, if I read tomorrow before the game that CJ Procise is out with a hangnail <laughs> or something like that, that's the handwriting he's on gone. the wall. Then he's, he has to be gone. He has to be. <laughs> but and again, I don't know that I want the Procise injury curse around the team either. That's true. That's a good point. Yeah. We we discussed this. Exactly. I know it feels like it's been a kind of an injury riddled preseason, but you look in comparison to some other teams, like say the Panthers with Cam Newton yeah. or <laughs> the Colts with Andrew Luck. Like it could be a lot worse. It could be a lot worse. And we're actually doing pretty good health wise going into the season. And really after that third preseason game, I looked at this team and I just, I feel really good about it. Like, we're very solid. We know, I feel like this year, in the beginning of the year, we won't have that four games of figuring out the style that we want to play with. Yeah. I think we're going to come out and actually play Seahawks football like we saw throughout the end of the season, but do it even more uh, efficiently. Brian Schottenheimer, I think, you know, is a little more established and has an idea of what he wants to do. Russell Wilson just looks like he is now in the mastery phase of quarterbacking. Mm -hmm. It really feels that way. Oh, it's night and day when you look at the preseason games where Russell Wilson is in the game with the starting offense and the starting offensive line. And then Geno Smith comes in, Paxton Lynch comes in and it just looks completely different. It looks completely different. And with Chris Carson being that physical force and then having depth behind him, that offensive line being the type of personnel that, We've needed to play this style of football for the last four or five years. Big, bruising road graders. I I just, I love the way the offense is, is looking. And I think people are sleeping. Like when I say people, the national media are sleeping at the playmakers on the perimeter. Um, I like the wide receiving core. I think Tyler Lockett is one of the top five receivers in the game. I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to say that. And I know that a lot of people will say that's blasphemy. But he's always open, deep, with, with magical efficiency. Yeah. I, I don't understand what you have anything bad to say about Tyler Lock. He's <laughs> awesome. And I just I love the way the offense looked. And then you flip to the defensive side of the ball, and I think that they're going to be able to stop the run. I think they're going to have a hard time getting after the passer. But I think the linebackers are going to cover up for a lot of that, not necessarily on blitzes, but just being great in coverage. And then the back end looks like it's going to be solid and they're going to be able to play that bend, but don't break defense and keep everything in front of them and keep it to a low scoring game. I I just, this team is going to be in every single game. It's going to be the same MO that you've seen throughout the Pete Carroll and Russell Wilson era. They rarely get blown out. Rarely. I I mean, I can count on one hand in the last six years when that's happened. Right. And it's good. 10 and six, 11 and five. Totally in range. We're going to lose a couple games that are going to be frustrating because of, you know, just style. Right. But Play, the team playing it close when they could be going for it potentially. And then you just can't get it done in the fourth quarter because a play here or there just makes it so it's not able to happen. 
But I got done watching that game, and I just had that feeling, you know, of they are who I thought they were. <laughs> you know what I mean? It like, totally this makes is how sense I, grammatically. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I just, when I got done watching, I was like, yes, this is the team that I envisioned going into this season. Does it have some flaws? Yes. Overall, is it as solid as a squad as any other team in the NFC? Absolutely. I went for 11 and five. You said 12 and four. I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be a fun year. <laughs> it really is. And it's going to be uh, a really interesting one. And it's going to be another year. Like everybody last year, remember, we're just crapping on the Hawks and being like, oh, they lost everybody and they're going to be terrible. And then they come out and they're like, oh, wow, surprise. They made the playoffs. How in the world did that ever possibly happen? And all of us who are true fans of the team Knew we were going to be solid going into that year, but I feel even better this year going in than I did the previous year with the team as a whole. And you still have the national media looking at it and going, well, they lost Earl Thomas, so they're going to be worse. <laughs> and like everybody just thinking that the Rams are just going to run away with this division again. And we haven't seen anything out of the Rams to know if they're going to be good or bad going on this year because Sean McVay has given everybody the, you know, princess treatment throughout uh, the preseason and nobody's played and coming off that Super Bowl loss and Todd Gurley's knee, blah, 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 blah. I just, it just feels like the Seahawks are going to surprise a lot of people. this year. Gosh, there's a lot of questions out there about the Rams and how they're going to start the season. They're probably oh, going to yeah. get lucky though. And, and have some, it's just going to be a cakewalk for them for the first couple of weeks somehow. Well, what's our schedule coming up? Like here, the first four weeks. Yeah, they start at Carolina with Cam Newton potentially being hurt. Mm -hmm. And then they come home and play New Orleans. New Orleans usually struggles out of the gate every year. Oh, I, my money's on Drew Brees there. Okay. And then early in the year, like warm weather, Drew Brees. Yeah, I like that a lot. Normally, the, the Saints get off to a slow start. I can't explain it. I don't know why. Well, here's I hope the thing. you're right. Drew Brees doesn't have any games to waste anymore. They don't, they don't have that luxury anymore. Well, and plus they need to win that game so then they can be feeling okay going into the game against Seattle and then lose that one. And you don't think that there's going to be some revenge factor for the Saints, uh, you know, after last year <laughs> and the way their season ended? That's true. Remember what they did to the Vikings after the Vikings had that miracle? <laughs> they did destroy them the next year. There you go. Yeah. Okay. And then you have the Browns. They're on the road against the Browns, who everybody's already penciled in as the AFC Super Bowl uh, representative. Sure which I, I don't buy at all. Well, now that the Colts aren't going to the Super Bowl, I think you've got to put Cleveland in that spot. Yeah. And then, uh, then they have the Bucks at home and that should be a win. But I mean, heck that two and two is realistic. I could see that maybe, but they could also go four and out through that schedule. Well, a lot depends on if cam plays week one. Cause will Greer's look like a dumpster fire. Yeah. Well, every um, <laughs> Ron Rivera says he has no doubt in his mind that he will. So there's that. And it's on the road. A road home opener is tough. Or a road home opener. That was one of the dumber things I've ever said. Uh, a road season opener, uh, you know, is, is difficult. It does look like Cam's going to be playing that week one game. Yeah, I would imagine he would. Um, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how the Rams start. Not only that, but not having played their starters throughout the preseason, there's got to be some rust there. Rust and then rust in Carolina humidity in the summertime. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know too much about that. That's not fun. No, mm -mm. no, I did. I did that over the 4th of July. That's not fun. Not fun. <laughs> no. Yeah. L.A. weather and and Carolina summer weather. <laughs> totally different. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Yeah. There's a there's a different factor there at, at play. Yeah. Yeah. Let's just go ahead and, and pencil the Rams in for two and two then. Right. Okay. And then, well, then to be fair, let's uh, let's look at our first four games. Okay. Bengals to start off the year at right. home. No AJ Green. Uh, like that feels like a win, right? Feels pretty good. Our pass rush might even be able to get home to the quarterback through the the Bengals offensive line. Right. Uh, then we're on the road in Pittsburgh. That's coin flip. Winnable game, but I could certainly see him losing that game it's as also well. Also, Pittsburgh's home opener. Right. And then Saints at home, you know, and that's could be they're going to be flip. coming off their their Rams victory, feeling all uh, high and mighty, and that's where he put the smack down because the Seahawks don't lose when I'm in the stadium and I'm going to be there. <laughs> so pencil that one in. 
And then uh, then we have the uh, JV Cardinals. On the road in the stadium that... Uh, That's built on an Indian burial ground? Yeah, right. yeah, that stadium. Yeah. <laughs> We always CJ so Prosize well. better not come to that game. <laughs> There's too much injury juju there. That's true. He needs to stay home if he's still on the 53 for that game. Mm-hmm. Or maybe he counteracts the bad juju if he's on the field and starting and healthy. Maybe that's it. Hard to say. But I mean, I could easily see the Seahawks being three and one after the first four games in leading the division and everybody going in all the headlines. What's wrong with the Rams? Is the bloom off the rose with genius Sean McVay? What's wrong with Todd Gurley? Maybe, you know, all that crap. I'm looking forward to it. This will be good. It's going to be fun. Is there anything that you're, else that you're looking forward to in this final preseason game? Other than getting through it with not having any... I mean, none of the starters are going to play. Yeah, none of the starters are going to play. They, I'd say the only thing that I'm really looking forward to in the fourth preseason game is for it to be over. Yeah. Just so just so that the next week is real live football and I couldn't be more stoked. Like that's good. I, this is what I've been waiting for. I've been kind of, you know, not into the football thing for the summer. <laughs> just been busy, you know, I, you know, keeping up to a degree. Yeah. You get into preseason a little up. bit. You'll watch, but maybe you don't watch live or you can't yep. watch live because of stupid uh, blackout Work. restrictions. Oh God! Did yeah. you have a blackout restriction where you are too? How oh, is yeah. how is in Mon- Montana? How is Montana out it, within the viewing area that you blackout NFL Network? Right, because the likelihood of all of us going to a game in from Montana to Seattle is so high. Well, it wasn't even in you- Seattle; it was in LA, but it was because it was on the local stations in Washington. That- that they right. blacked it out on NFL Network. Well, we're not in Washington. We're in Montana. Right. Why are you blacking out? Because we don't have local stations that carry the Seahawks here. Well, not only that. So, okay, you got to carry the uh, the Washington broadcast, like the, the, the Seattle bo- broadcast. Like, why do people in Montana need to watch ads from Seattle? <laughs> right. Like, we're, we're not we're not patronizing Seattle on the daily. You know what I mean? And not only that, but our population is itty bitty. What are, what are you doing? What were they doing? I don't I didn't get that at all. Ugh. I did end up having to I, I listened to Steve Rabel and Joel McHale on the broadcast. And how was that? That was pretty fun. It was okay. it was exactly like if you took an average Seahawks fan who, you know, loves Steve Rabel yeah. and put him in the booth without any broadcasting experience. I mean, he has acting experience. He has comedy experience, yeah. but he doesn't have, you know, in-game broadcast experience. Right. So he was able to tell jokes and it was so it was fun. It was it made it feel like you were in the booth with Steve Rabel and just being a fanboy throughout the game. And because that's how Joel that's that's the, the that's way he, he approached it. Yeah. I mean, good for him. Uh, that's great. Yeah, it was fun. <laughs> All right. Well, tweet at Joel McHale and see if we can't get him on the podcast after his breakout performance in the preseason. <laughs> He was self-deprecating throughout it. He knew that he didn't know what he was doing or really have any business like as an actual play caller. But because right. uh, his his uh, analysis uh, consisted of, yeah, go or get him. <laughs> right. And uh, yeah, he's basically my only credentials for me being here is that I'm Joel McHale. Yeah. It was either me or Rain Wilson. So <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. I think that pretty much covers it. We're going to have to, I think we, it's time to get to the second half of the show. Unless you have anything else you want to talk about. No, I think I'm good. Okay. Cause I want to, I, I do want to talk a little Andrew Luck on the, on the flip side. Oh yeah. We'll get to Andrew Luck. We will get to maybe some Russell Wilson talk as well. And of course we got, we got to welcome some new members of the flock after the break. Hey, all right. I've, I've, I'm liking this little run that we're on bunch of new flockers. Getting into the second half of the show. And see, I'm glad we cut off that first half early because then now I can feel like this will truly be a second half because I know this, I said before, it kind of bugs me. We got some news during the break. The Seahawks making room on the defensive line, waving defensive tackle JT Tiuli. Okay. You remember that name. Yeah, I didn't even know he was on the team. So that uh, I guess it's about the same for me now. <laughs> I know I've been looking at some of these 53 man you- roster projections with the projected cuts. Yeah. And especially looking at the guys that might have to be cut at linebacker. Mm-hmm. And uh, guys like Jawan Johnson or Justin Curry. Okay. 
They're they're apparently on the team still. Easier cuts to make, I would say. Yeah. Do you think that the uh, the cutting of a defensive lineman is a uh, preliminary move to make room for the addition of Clowney? It has to be. I'm starting to I, get hyped for this now. I would I would just like that to be true. <laughs> I, I mean, sometimes if you just put stuff out there, you kind of speak it into uh, existence. Yeah, it's, a, it's what I'm hoping for. Well, I, I feel like we've done pretty good to this point because up until now, we've kind of been downplaying the idea of like, oh, yeah, clowning to the Seahawks. It won't happen. It's not going to happen. Right. It's just don't even count on it. And now it, seeing those latest reports that we could be among three teams that are in consideration still. Right. That, uh, now I feel like we did our work up until now. And now is the time to get hyped to make it happen and, and kind of wish it into existence. Yeah, to create unreasonable expectations. That's great. I'm glad we're here to do that. <laughs> well, we've talked about in the past how uh, it's okay to not be awesome at every position. And clearly mm-hmm. at pass rush, that's where the team isn't awesome right now. Right. And uh, I just don't know if I'm okay with being okay with it. Right. <laughs> I, I, I would rather not be okay with it and be and be at least pretty good at all the positions. <laughs> exactly. Well, one one team that I do know is lesser at a position than when uh, their preseason started is Indianapolis Colts at quarterback. Yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> it turns out Andrew Luck retiring Saturday night. A little bit of a surprise. Holy smokes. Was that a surprise? <laughs> I, w- I was stunned. I-, I think that is the most stunned that I have been regarding a retirement in my fandom regarding the NFL. And that's even taken into consideration like Barry Sanders. Like Calvin Johnson didn't stun me. No, like he, I, it, he had had a, a solid career. And I and you just kind of, you'd kind of heard how tough it was on his body. And I guess you have with Andrew Luck as well. But um, yeah, it was, it was shocking. And my, my reaction went a lot like this within the first five minutes was like, oh my God, Andrew Luck just retired. Then it was, ha ha, eat it, the entire national media who loves Andrew Luck more than Russell Wilson. <laughs> it's easy to see the last man standing from that draft who is the best quarterback easily, hands down, is Russell Wilson debate now over. And then it was, oh man, that's, what what happened to Andrew Luck to cause this? And then you hear his press conference and it was like, damn, he really has been through the ringer. I feel real terrible for the guy. This is probably for the best. And then, you know, just like a little bit of empathy and then seeing Colts fans like boo the hell out of him. And and then people coming down on them and being like, "Eh, I kind of get it. Like I get why they did that in the moment. And it was just all over the map. It was a roller coaster. (laughs) You've described the, the roller coaster very well. And I, when I first saw the news, I thought, no, that, that's that's got to be that felt fake. That felt fake. And it was not fake. I did my check. I clicked on the account. I looked at the number of followers. I looked to see if it was a fake blue check versus a, a real blue check. And it's like, holy smokes, man, what a scoop on a story to have that break <laughs> during the preseason game. Because uh, Luck apparently had it planned out. He was going to do the whole press conference thing where he, mm-hmm. you know, got dressed up in a suit and did it, you know, kind of the way that he wanted to do it and then forced into having to do this makeshift press conference because the mm-hmm. news was already out and you couldn't really escape it th- th- at that point. So it was, it was good to see him go ahead and do that. But it was also, man, what a tough decision for him to have to make. And it sounds like he's doing the right thing, but I'm also kind of curious go how this is going to go moving forward. So I had heard that apparently there was some of the money that he's been paid that he would possibly have to forfeit, but the Colts are going to allow him to keep it. Yeah. In that sort of thing. I, I, I'm there. There's a lot of takes to be had regarding Andrew Luck, right. In this retirement. And the majority of people in this day and age are like, Yay, hooray player, he got out, you know, and that, that's been kind of the, 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 I don't know, general consensus out there. Whereas, you know, 15, 20 years ago, people would be like, you're getting paid to play football. What are you doing, you big whiner? Get back out there. And much as it always is for us, like I kind of fall somewhere in the middle. Like I understand the idea that he's been through hell uh, regarding injuries, but also too, like you're under contract. 
Like, I don't, I don't care that you're tired. You know what happens when the rest of us are tired at our job? We strap, we put on the boot over the swollen foot and we go to freaking work. And I know, and yeah, it's mentally draining. And yes, it's hard, but you just go out there and do it. Yeah. People are relying on you. And I, I don't know that enough people are, you know, taking to task the player over this. Like, I just, this is, this is tough. It's tough for me because. I, I kind of feel the same way as teammates. I think they kind of understand, but for a fan base that was counting on a healthy Andrew Luck, because that was a team that had Super Bowl aspirations. And after his mm-hmm. comeback season last year, you got the head coach with Frank Reich. You're starting to put together a pretty good defense. You're getting pieces on the offensive line, finally being able to protect that quarterback that you invested so heavily in as the right. Colts. And I mean, that's, that's part of where I do point the finger. If, if you're a fan looking to blame somebody man, blame, blame the Colts for not putting enough in front of Andrew Luck early on in his career to be able to keep him healthy. But you know, Luck also deserves some of that blame too, because he was a reckless kind of player uh, who wasn't afraid to take hits. And that's one of the things that listening to other podcasts, other radio stations, they always play Mm -hmm. the clips of Andrew Luck saying, Oh, Hey, good hit, buddy. Yeah. You really got me good hit. And, and just, he, there's a number of clips where he's congratulating Mm -hmm. on defenders on laying a a big hit into him, And that you kind of look back at that now and say, yeah, maybe that wasn't the best decision making on your part. If you wanted to have this be a long-term deal for you. Well, I know that, uh, from listening to the Bill Simmons podcast, he went through a little bit of the history of Ryan Grigson as the GM of the Colts during that time period and the type of capital that he invested in offensive linemen to protect, you know, a generational quote unquote talent. Right. And it was precisely two offensive linemen draft picks above the seventh round throughout those first four years of Andrew Luck's career. Yeah. And they were both whiffs and you just, you can't do that. Yeah, you can't do that. And that is negligence on the part of the franchise. And they really did put Andrew Luck in a position to where he is where he is now. And yeah, I, I have a hard time blaming Andrew Luck. But with a $100 million in the bank over the first, what, six, seven years of his career here. I, it's a lot easier to walk away. I guarantee you if he was just an average working stiff and you're living paycheck to paycheck, you don't just get to be like, well, I'm a little mentally drained, so <laughs> I, I'm I'm walking away. Yeah, I mean, there's there's some entitlement there that is difficult for me to swallow. Yeah, go to work, do your job. You're under contract, and I mean, his dad, his dad is a wealthy man and has done well for himself. I mean, it's not like this this kid like came from nothing and scratched and clawed his way to the top of the heap. I mean, he went to Stanford. It, it, you know, with a, with a rich father, got drafted number one overall, made a hundred million dollars, and because he had a few boo boos along the way, he needs to he needs to retire because he's just too tired. To, he's he's just he just doesn't have the mental toughness to to go through it anymore. And I think that's the difference between drafting somebody like the Seahawks always do with Russell Wilson, who's been through some crap, and it's always been a struggle. He's always had to overcome. Yeah. And the, the, you talk about grit, and I think. A little bit. Uh, he's a tough guy. Don't get me wrong, Andrew Luck. But this retirement shows me a little bit of a lack of grit. And there's going to be some blowback uh, on this, I'm sure, from people. <laughs> but I, I just, I, th- I think we've swung a little too far to the player empowerment, you know, coddling of these athletes. Well, you do see, and I'll, I'll take it to, you know, that that level of grit that you see you know, especially in the sealed community, right? With the, the Navy mm-hmm. SEALs, there's a lot of people that they can be the best athlete, you know, the big muscle bound dude that, you know, just every ha- had had it easy in the weight room, able to to run 20 miles and and goes out there had and just all the physical tools and gifts. all the physical tools to gifts. And you go and you'd look at the dude and you go, wow, that guy will have no problem making it through SEAL training. And he's going to be, you know, a, an amazing soldier. And then that's the guy that goes out and gets, you know, washed out in the first three weeks, doesn't even make it to, to hell week. Right. 
And but you have these other dudes that are, you know, like growing up in the backwoods of Montana who never had anything given to them, worked for everything. Yeah, they may not be able to run a a five minute mile, but they're going to go out there and they're going to get it done. And they've kind of worked that toughness groove into their bones, like just throughout their entire life. Yeah. And those are the guys who make it and and make it through. And kill Osama bin Laden. (laughs) Right. He, right? Because the guy that did that was from Butte, America. Yeah. Like, I and mean, that's that's where he's from. And it's not that both, you know, that one's one, that one way is better than another. It's just a different kind of mentality that you right. grow up with that you that you carry on with you and you're able to make this. And, and maybe entitlement is a good way to to kind of put the, the word to use. Yeah, maybe it is. I And also, too, as a fan, if I were a fan of the Colts, I'd be furious. Are you kidding me? Yeah. You signed you signed the new deal a couple years ago. Like you I, and you had no intention of playing it out. And then not only that, but I bought my season tickets this year to watch us go on a potential Super Bowl run with my franchise quarterback and you're quitting because you have a calf strain? Like I just I, I would I would be furious. Okay, let's put a pin in that because I do want to get to that idea of of the fans booing Andrew Luck as he's leaving the field. But first, I want to get to welcoming some new members of the flock, Adam. Perfect. Let's do this, man. All right. I need I need uh, some more little flockers among us here. Yeah, get in the flock.com if you want to sign up on Patreon and become a member of the flock there. I if you don't like Patreon, I found this new site glow.fm. If you go to glow.fm forward slash flock, uh, you can sign up there too. So it's just a, another way to do it for eh, some people don't like Patreon and some people That's don't fine. like I, PayPal. I that. Another option. But are there, wait, what is a dot FM? That, that feels, that feels fake. <laughs> is that like a North Korean uh, web hosting site or something? No, no. I think it's for you know, radio station type audio uh, sites. They go with the dot FM. I see. Okay. Yeah. There's I all kinds know. of dot things. Now you can get I, dot I, name, you can get dot X, Y, Z, which seems weird, but people do it. Yeah, well, that, that uh, that's all weird. I have I have dot show for this podcast. Are we out of dot coms? Is that where we're at? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you think about it, why does it have to be dot com? They're just letters. I, I get it, but it just, you know, I don't my my phone doesn't autofill in dot X, Y, Z, P, D, Q. <laughs> doesn't do it. I do kind of want dot P, D, Q now. There you go. But getintheflock.com, uh, that's the place where most people go. Uh, we have seahawkerspodcast.com slash support. And Eric from Austin came in this week with a one-time $20 donation. So thanks to Eric. Welcome to the flock. No, oh, thanks, man. Down there deep in, uh, well, I guess, like, where would you say Austin's fandom is, is between Dallas and Houston? Probably more Dallas. I think it's probably more Dallas. Yeah, but if the, you know, you're among Houston fans, maybe try to convince them they need to trade Clowney up here. There you go. Yeah, Help us out, Eric. Yeah. Do the do the groundwork. I think he can do this. I actually believe in Eric. <laughs> and if it doesn't happen, I know who to hold responsible. It's going it, to be it, Eric's it's fault. It's Eric from Austin. Yeah. Yep. Thanks for the donation, but sorry, you're taking the blame on this one if we don't get clowned. <laughs> <Right. laughs> Got some monthly supporters to thank, starting with Joshua Scarlett in at 1212. Welcome to the flock, Josh. Ooh, all right. I like the the last name Scarlet. I don't know why. Just it it feels good. It's good. It's solid. Yeah. Ben in at twelve twelve. Welcome to the flock, Ben. Wow, is he like Prince? He just has one name now. Well, he has Ben S. Do that mean we get to make up any S last name for him? Yes. Okay. Well, if I was gonna be nice, I'd call him Ben Seahawk or Scarlet. You know, Scarlet's a solid last name. Yeah, we already have one of them. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Well, we already have a Lisa in Seattle too, but Lisa in Seattle joined the flock at five dollars a month. What? Yeah, it, it, t- it took long enough. No, no, this is a different Lisa in Seattle. <laughs> oh, we've got to. Oh, uh, so are we collecting all the Lisas in Seattle's? <laughs> I hope so. That's cool. We've got two. All right. So if you happen to be a Lisa in Seattle and you haven't gotten in the flock, you're clearly screwing this up. Join the other Lisas. Let's go. So thank you, Lisa. So we have Lisa one, and then this this, this must gonna have to be like Lisa A, right? Sure. Because one can't be above the other. No, you need to have. Right. Right. I don't know how we're gonna do this. Yeah. I'm worried. Well, somehow we'll figure it out. 
And if we can't figure it out, when we're there week three for the Saints game, we're going to have a Lisa in Seattle fight. Yes. Gonna, it's going to be a joust to the death or something. <laughs> Not yeah. to the death because we we need the supporters, but to at least <laughs> um, have a hierarchy. Gotcha. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Byra in Kentucky in at $5. Welcome to the flock, Byra. Yeah, absolutely welcome to the flock. Uh, and welcome to... Uh, the Patreon Pick'em League. That's going to be fun, too. Yes, getting in the Patreon Pick'em League. I'm sure I'm probably going to have to start a third one, but uh, SeahawkersPodcast.com slash Pick'em. Uh, the group ID for uh, this next one is 18882. So 18,882 and then SHP12 to get into that Pick'em League. If that one fills up, I'll start another one. Okay, I guess I better do that. And uh, <laughs> like Yahoo didn't fix this, fix this after the last podcast. No, no, but we did have some offers to help us do the the compilation of the spreadsheets, or you know, potentially oh, uh, maybe scrape the scoring from the websites to to do something automatically. We'll we'll figure something out. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, that that's great. That's why the little flockers are the best, man. Yeah. Uh, other little flockers joining our flock. Aaron Moore in at three dollars. Welcome to the flock, Aaron. Welcome, Aaron. Jason Tate in at three dollars. Welcome to the flock to Jason. That holy cow! How many of these do we have? I think that's it. That's it. Well, here's the thing: like uh, Aaron and Jason would have gotten a little more run if they would have joined, say, like middle of the off season. Yeah, but they they're getting in at a popular time. Yeah, they waited to the last minute. It's crunch time now. before the pick and right. league starts up. Before the season starts up, I understand. Yeah. I'm excited about more competitors in the uh, Patreon Pick'em League. Yes. Like, that's going to be fun. Got lots of prizes. Mm -hmm. If you want a, the list of the prizes, and I'm, I'm not going to run down it right now, but uh, go back a couple shows. It's it's a good, solid list. I think it, is. it was the season expectations show, so check that out. And uh, it, while we still give away prizes to freeloaders who join the other Pick'em League, our regular Pick'em oh, League, yeah. we give better prizes to people who aren't freeloaders and actually get in the flock. Yeah, right. So don't be a freeloader. It's lame. <laughs> but if you like former players like uh, Thomas Rawls or mm -hmm. Jeremy Lane, you know, there's prizes for you, too. <laughs> right. <laughs> or Nas Jones now, apparently, that he's going to IR. I have a Nas, jo I have a Nas Jones signed football. Uh, that's a bummer. That'll probably go to a freeloader. But it's still yeah, a cool probably. prize. It is a cool prize because Nas could be back. It's not nothing. Right. Which is what it could be. <laughs> is is Nas going with uh, designation to return or like just gong gong for the year? I think they they waived him with an injury designation. And then if no team picks him up off waivers, kind of like with Amaro Darbo, then he reverts mm. back to what Seattle. What was the injury? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, this is the first. Uh, honestly, this is the first I'm hearing of this. Nas Jones sent to IR along with Kalen Reed. He was the other guy that went to IR. Okay. And it was uh, a knee injury. Really? And Reed has a neck injury. Ooh, yeah. Uh, take care of that. Yeah. Yeah, knees, I, th I feel like you can work those back to health. Right. A little but bit your easier. neck bones are connected to your head bones, and that's important. Yeah. So, yeah, take care of that. I also need to take care of thanking those uh, members of the flock who gave us raises. Oh, really? Yeah, Jerv Reed went from three to five. So thanks to Jerv. Hell yeah, man. And Jerry Keeney, also from one to three. So thanks to Jerry. Yeah, appreciate it, guys. I guess, we, guess we're doing okay. Hey, it's the beginning of the year. This is, like you said, this is the time when, when people are getting fired up. We have more right. shows that we do. Uh, I've been, you know, cranking out the field goals shows. Yes, you have. We, I, we had a 53-man roster breakdown with Alistair Corp that was pretty fun, even though he's told me he's cutting Deshaun Shedd, which I'm not a real big fan of. Oh, well, uh, good thing he's not the GM. I know. <laughs> but the way he broke it down, it kind of makes it sound like it's, it has the potential to happen, too. Maybe. I, there's a lot of potential to happen. <laughs> That's a true fact. You don't have a strong feeling of, of whether or not Deshaun Shedd makes the roster, though? I think he makes the roster. Gosh, he should, shouldn't he? Yeah. But you also got Ugo Amani, you got Marquise Blair at safety, Lano Hill. I think Lano Hill gets cut. Yeah, that I would I would guess he would get cut over Shed. But who knows, man? I don't know. Like, <laughs> Saturday's gonna be interesting. Yeah. Jamar Taylor, he kind of seems like he's your top nickel corner, but also the way he's played may not be your top nickel corner. 
Right. <laughs> yeah. It hasn't been hasn't been an eye popping uh, performance. That's for sure. No. No. Well, he's it hasn't been a dumpster fire either. Yeah. You've noticed him, though, in a bad way. Yeah. We got a review this last week. An overdue review says, in fact, it's titled Long Overdue. Oh, OK. Well, better late than never. Better so that's great. Me. Exactly. After many months of procrastination on leaving a review, the last episode made it mandatory that I do now. <laughs> Adam's do better about the butt sweat debacle had me laughing so hard <laughs> the back of my head started to hurt. So Adam, for creating the funniest moment on the show for me yet, you are better at life than Skip Bayless. Oh, well, thanks, man. Well, uh, I, I appreciate the uh, the review, and uh, I but I didn't want to make you laugh so hard that you injured yourself. Like I don't want I don't want the little flockers to turn into like a bunch of little processes, and like if they laugh too hard, then they get hurt. Yeah. So be careful with yourself, man. Be careful, and Ooh. I'll uh, I'll try to be funny, but uh, not injury funny. I liked uh, Annalisa's uh, reaction to the butt mm-hmm. sweat portion of the show, saying it's it, it seemed like it lasted four hours. Yeah, I mean, it could have. Uh, I thought we condensed it down pretty good, but I mean, this is a this is a major issue, and uh, I just thought people needed to think about uh, saw and like what it could do to um, to a quarterback. So. Yeah, think about what saw can do to you. <laughs> yeah, and I just appreciate the fact that Justin Britt's uh, uh, behind is uh, relatively dry. He has, a, so he has nice. a low saw level that we know of. Exactly. Yeah. Paul in San Diego checking in. One of our members of the flock and members of the Ring of Honor uh, says he hasn't been active in a bit because he's been on deployment, uh, which you know makes all the sense why we haven't seen him on Facebook. But he said, I, right. felt, I felt compelled to write when I saw Andrew Luck retired. Do you think he'll still be ranked in all the top 10 QB lists? Maybe at least this time he'll be behind Russ. <laughs> you, yeah, that's what it finally takes, right? Yeah. <laughs> Says I'm catching up on as much of the, of the preseason as I can, but it's been pretty challenging. It's a crapshoot what games we get on the ship. Miss you all. Can't wait to listen to all the podcasts I miss. It'll be a long time and it'll be dated, but it'll be worth it. Go Hawks from Paul. Ah, Go Hawks. So is Paul back now? Is he is he now done with deployment? See, he usually checks in from a random port, so I think he's still out. Okay. Well, uh, stay safe and afloat out there. Yes. I worry about people on boats on the ocean. Like that's a, that, that, I don't like it. No? No. No, that's some scary stuff. It's a we little sketchy. We don't belong sketchy. out there. Do you, have, do you have gills or fins? Because if you don't, guess where you don't belong? In the ocean. <laughs> the biggest eye-opening thing for me was reporting to a ship, and then everybody learns how to fight fire which makes a lot of sense because if there's a fire on the boat, like you can't call anybody else to help. Right. But the bonus of having a fire on a boat is you have lots of water to put it out. There's plenty of seawater and that's, that's generally what you use. But yeah. uh, you know, when you have lots of fuel also on a big ship, because it takes a lot of fuel to make those things mm-hmm. go. Right. Um, you know, there's potential. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's not good. No. Yeah. No, I, I'd say out of all the potential uh, sea risks on a giant boat, uh, what, what are the biggest? Like, is fire the biggest? I think fire is the biggest. Or are holes in the boat the biggest? Maybe 1A, 1B. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know. I wasn't in the Navy. I thought maybe you'd have insight on this. No, well, the, the good thing about the holes in the boat, there's so many doors that you can close. You know, they, they build it in a way so that if a hole uh, opens up, that you can mm-hmm. shut some doors down and hopefully keep it relatively watertight. So the yeah, boat wasn't the Titanic like that too. Water. Yeah. 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 Things can happen quickly. It's not always. Yeah. Water flows fast. Water flows fast. <laughs> so there's the, there's potential there. Yeah. I've seen the right, Titanic. Well, I'm just worried about Paul. I just want him to stay afloat. Okay? Stay afloat, Paul. Don't sink. <laughs> it's, it's really the one <laughs> thing you want to avoid when you're on a ship. <laughs> right. Rule number one. <laughs> Yeah, don't sink. <laughs> I should be an admiral. <laughs> <laughs> you could be in charge of the whole Navy. Okay, we're yeah. going to keep all of our ships floating this year. That yeah. will be number one goal. Car- right, and then number two goal, no fires. <laughs> no no fires. Right, ready, break. Kinda, Let's go. Kind of ties in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you'd do fine. Except for the whole being out on the ocean thing. Can't do it. You can't Mm-mm. do that. Nope. What do you say we get on some do better and better at life? All right, man. Who you got for do better? All right. 
my do better. I said I wanted to come back to the fans that were booing okay. Andrew Luck because all this whining about how Andrew Luck got booed by, you know, maybe a handful of people coming off the field. I listened to the video. It wasn't like the boos were just raining down. Cascading. No, yeah. it wasn't that bad. It, it was mostly you could hear like when we went to the Giants game. And you had the microphone on, on one part of the audience. There was when yeah. I heard the audio of the booing of Andrew Luck, it was one guy going like really loud. Boo! <laughs> you know, it wasn't right. it wasn't like it was raining down. Yeah. The other the other part about people kind of whining about this, this booing situation is as a fan in this particular situation, mm -hmm. your options are pretty limited. You can cheer, right? I'm guessing not a lot of Colts fans who had aspirations of a healthy Andrew Luck taking him to the Super Bowl. Those guys, th those people didn't want to cheer. I don't think so. <laughs> you could clap, which that could maybe be the best option. Yeah. Yeah. How about it? There's are there any nonverbal uh, things you could do? Like, could you just give him like a thumbs down? <laughs> you could give him a thumbs down. Like, you, I'm you disappointed could, with you right you, now. You know what? That could maybe be... I don't know. The thumbs down, though, coming off the field. That's that's kind of aggressive. In the it's moment aggressive? Too. <laughs> well, it's... I think giving somebody the bird would be aggressive. <laughs> yeah. I think the thumbs down is like, eh, I'm a little sad right now. Boo. I, th I yeah, think maybe boo. I think I'm going with boo. <laughs> <laughs> boo seems OK to me. You could yeah. do nothing, but I, I don't think that anybody's feeling like doing nothing in that moment. Right. Booing really seems like the natural, like, I'm not happy about this, and I want to let you know, and whether or not you're letting Andrew Luck know. There, right. See, that's the problem with the boo. There's no context. Well, it, here's the thing. Maybe it's a lot like being in a relationship, like tone matters. So, like, you know, if it's one thing, if you go, boo, <laughs> right? Like, you know, like, what the gal in The Princess Bride, like the old lady, right? Yeah. Like, like that sort of aggressive boo. I mean, you're just kind of like, hey, man, boo. Yeah, you know, like, like come I, on, come on, man. Well, and really, that's the most appropriate because as a fan, you think finding out in the middle of a meaningless preseason game is the best way to find out that your quarterback that you drafted to replace Peyton Manning only got to play two full seasons after Manning right. retired. You got the 2016 season where the Colts went eight and seven and you got the 2018 season where they went ten, 10 and six. So the guy that was supposed to replace Peyton Manning ends up playing in as many playoff games as actual Peyton Manning since that time. And the actual Peyton Manning played in two Super Bowl games and won one of them. See, one thing that we're kind of glossing over here with this Andrew Luck retirement is that I think now that the Red Sox have broken their curse and the Cubs have broken their curse, I think this is the start of a very long hundred year curse for the <laughs> Indianapolis Colts because they just, they just, you know, brush Peyton Manning to the side you know, after he has a, a neck injury for, you know, the bright, shiny new Andrew Luck in all you get out of it is seven years of more or less disappointment, you know, two good years and then five years of disappointment. And now you're in Nowheresville. And uh, I, I think it's the beginning. You're seeing the beginnings of the Manning curse. And that's a solid reason to boo. That's one that I didn't even consider. Uh, among the short list of why there could be fans booing. I think the main reason is that it's a terrible way to find out that your 2019 season isn't going to be nearly what you thought it was. Right. And so for anyone chastising fans for being a bit upset in the moment, I think it's fair to be a little bit emotional in, in that particular time. It, you know, maybe fans aren't in the best space halfway through a game, a few drinks in during a preseason game where your diehard fans are going to be there at the for a preseason game. And that's how they find out. So for anyone going after the fans in booing Andrew Luck and maybe them not being in the rational space to consider all the pain that Andrew Luck has had to try and play through over the years. Do better. Yeah, I'm with you on that one. I heard Cowherd put it uh, a certain way. And basically, he was just like, look, fan is short for fanatical. And I mean, you're fanatical. Like, this is where you're you're putting like an uh, an extra amount of passion, like you know, a little more than average 
and you're three beers in and you're like looking forward to week one and all of a sudden your star quarterback just disappeared. He's just gone now. Yeah, you're, you like, get he's, a text he's from no a buddy. Hey, did you did you see the tweet from Adam, Adam Schefter? No. Is this fake? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm guessing my reaction probably wouldn't be the most measured at that point. <laughs> no. So, yeah. No, that's reacting in the moment. Well, I'm glad things have turned a little bit because everything that I heard after that, that first, you know, into Sunday and Monday morning, all the talking heads were like, oh, I can't believe the fans are booing Andrew Luck off the field after everything that he's done, you know, having his kidney lacerated and peeing blood. And yeah. Yeah. Torn labrum, you yeah. know, all that stuff. Right? Yeah, I get it. He's been hurt, and hurt bad. Yeah, I understand that. But <laughs> I don't think that they were give you thinking, a free pass. I don't think they were considering all of that Andrew Lux stuff in the moment. They were living right? in the moment of just finding out the news. Exactly. So, yeah, context matters. It turns out. Turns out. My do better this week, Brandon, is for ESPN's Mina Kimes. And she is she is a, a, a quote unquote Seahawks fan. She watched, uh, you know, the Seahawks a lot growing up with her dad. Yeah. And uh, she uh, is become the uh, one of the radio announcers for or the TV announcers for Rams preseason football because she lives in L.A. And I heard her on the Bill Simmons podcast uh, earlier this week. And uh, one of our listeners tipped me off to this podcast being like, oh, they talk a lot of Seahawks and, you know, all that. And I was like, okay, cool. So like I turn it on and, um, you know, in the show notes, it's like one of the bullet points is the Russell Wilson decade. And I was like, Ooh, this will be good. Lots of Russell Wilson discussion and, and all that. No, there was barely any Seahawks talk. It was almost all about the freaking Rams who (laughs) she's now quote unquote covering. And not only that, but it was a lot of glowing, nice stuff about the Rams. Like Sean McVay is truly a really great guy. (laughs) And the GM is super charming. And when he asked me to do the broadcast, I just couldn't say no. And, (laughs) and just, you know, there there's guys that are really up and coming on the Rams and just all this glow for the catfishing Rams. Catfish the Rams. Catfish them. Okay? Like, I know you, you're a Seahawks fan. You're a 12. What are you doing? I understand they're writing your checks right now, but you just you need to be a token fan and at least crap on them a little bit. <laughs> a little bit? You got to be crapping on the Rams. <laughs> like, it was just too much love. I couldn't stand it. And for Mina Kimes, who needs to get her fandom in check, do better. She needs to do better. And you know what? Now... Now it's gone to the point where Russell Wilson is getting in on this. And that's why Russell Wilson this week is my better at life for going after Mina Kimes on Instagram. He and did? For, yes. Yeah. He, he, he posted because uh, Mina posted a photo of, I think she was prepping for one of the Rams games. She's wearing her Rams polo. She's got her, her dog in her lap and Russell posting in the comments on the Instagram photo. Mina, is that a Ram shirt? Say it isn't so. And and Mina responds on, on Twitter to what Sam Hawk Badger posts by saying, I'm reaping what I've sowed. And then Russell Wilson responds on Twitter saying, Mina, my heart and all of Seahawks Twitter, including at Cable Thanos right now. And attached to Russell's Twitter post is that picture of him crying after winning the NFC championship game mm-hmm. against the Packers. Right. So the point is, is that Russell Wilson is going after Mina Kimes, whether it's on Instagram or Twitter. And for that, Russell Wilson, better at life than Skip Bayless. That's my quarterback right there. <laughs> right there. That's what I needed. I, I didn't know that he was coming to the defense of all of our 12s and helping to call out uh, Mina on this. And uh, I really, I really appreciate uh where he's coming yes, from. Yes, this has like, gone all the way to the top. You know, when I brought this up just a few shows ago that she was going to be on the sidelines calling a Rams game in the preseason, you know, this was just at very low levels of Seahawks fandom that were concerned about this. Right, and we thought maybe she could be like a mole, an insider. Yeah. No. But now, from what you've made it sound like, is that she's actually giving the Rams props and not 
it's one thing you could be objective and say, you know, I, I really have some questions, you know, with some of the losses that the Rams have had on defense. You know, can they continue to do it? You know, they've mm-hmm. the offensive line, you know, they've lost some guys up front. Are they really mm-hmm. going to be able to protect Jared Goff now going into the season? There's right. some big questions here that I think are that we're going to need answers from. And by the starters not playing in the preseason, we don't get those answers until the regular season. That's talking about it from a, an objective point of view that that really a Rams fan can have questions about, too. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe it's that ESPN is employing Mina as well. And uh, we all know how much the league needs it to work in <laughs> L.A. And uh, ESPN being a giant partner with uh, the NFL, they need it to work in L.A. And that's why you see all those amazing articles about the Rams and how great they are. And there's never any questions about anything they do. Uh, and because she's in the employ of both the Rams and ESPN, ergo the league, like she's just she's just caught and she can't do anything else. Like I, I want, I want to picture her more as a hostage in this situation, <laughs> and this is against her will, and give her a little benefit of the doubt. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> There's still time. I need. You know what? I'm going to need to see out of her. Is I'm going to need to see the first time we beat the Rams this year. I'm going to need to see like some sort of gloating as a twelve regarding the victory. Oh yeah, right. No, and no rub co- it in their face yeah, a little bit. Not being conflicted at all. About the Seahawks right. beating the Rams. Yeah, we need to see your allegiance here. I think we will. I think this is I'm just worried. this is like a fleeting thing. This is like you've been married for like 40 <laughs> years and like a cute girl walks by and like you're intrigued for a minute. Right. But then because, you're like, oh, yeah, there's not a lot going on there because, you know, maybe she throws a little money your way mm-hmm. and have a good time. You know, right. how do we get in on some of this Rams need to work in L.A. money? I You have to stop crapping on the Rams first. And I uh, did Mina, no did Mina stop money. crapping on the Rams, though. Well, I think to get paid, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, once and, and the there's no amount come of in. money. There's none. I, 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 I can't. There's an amount for everything. This might be one of the things that I don't. I, I think is an unbendable value. For I don't me. know. Aaron Donald's really good. Sean McVay's really handsome. Did you just say that with a straight <laughs> face? Go wash your mouth out with soap. Yeah, it better be green. Yeah, Brandon Cooks is really fast. Cooper Cup, he's a Washington guy. GR double gross trying to position myself for this. This Rams need to work in LA money, Adam. Yeah. Well, I, I'm about to have to say a bunch of nice things about the Rams. I haven't seen the script yet, but uh, <laughs> uh bear from the Rams podcast has sent that in and uh, I'm about to have to read it. So. Oh yeah. Yeah. And you guys finalized your bet. Yes, we did. Uh, it, it's funny. Uh, Cause the initial suggestion was what Brandon yards uh oh, thrown yeah. by yeah, each quarterback. quarterback quarterback passing yards i was like well you clearly don't listen to the show because if you did you'd understand that yards don't matter and uh that that's a stupid bet and there's no way i'm taking that and uh and then in because they live in that delusional la bubble uh bear suggested that we bet uh who has more passing touchdowns and uh i think that's an amazing bet subtracting interceptions Right. Which, again, that's an amazing (laughs) bet because there has been no season where uh, Jared Goff has outperformed Russell Wilson in this category, especially with Russ coming off of uh, a season where he threw the most uh, touchdowns ever in his career. And the season before that, he led the league in touchdowns. Yeah. And he never throws picks. So this is great. Uh, I can't wait to get my first win. I'm I'm glad that you're in position for a win. I'm not even sure I'm in a position for a betting because uh, I think the one suggestion that I've seen is Todd Gurley versus Chris Carson in total yards, which seems like you have you have two injury issues in in this particular situation. I if they if you could guarantee me that they both have uh I don't know fourteen starts this year, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like if they both had at least fourteen starts. And I knew that they were both going to be healthy. That's a legit bet. I think that could be close. Yeah. It's just my concern is if we're going total yards, I'm now worrying. I'm now banking on the fact of Todd Gurley being less healthy than Chris Carson. And yeah. I, I don't like banking on an injury to get a win. Right. That yeah, feels it does. Dirty. It feels like an injury driven bet. Yeah. Like that's the straw that serves the drink of that bet. And I don't like it. Because I'm sure that he probably does get more injured than Chris Carson. But it just, yeah, yeah. going, just going feels there like with bad the, juju. It, yes, it does. Yeah. 
and with CJ Procise maybe still being on the team, I don't I don't need <laughs> Juju in in different directions. No, no, we need it. We need the, we need all the good Juju. All the good Juju. All right, man. Well, uh, moving on to my better life than Skip Bayless this week. It's yeah. for the Indianapolis Colts. Oh, yeah, because they are completing the circle of life when it comes to quarterbacks from the 2012 draft. So basically, they have Andrew Luck retire. Yeah, and they're now bringing in the Cali kid, the man from Montana. Brock Osweiler for a visit. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, all I need them to do now is bring in RG3, uh, Brandon Whedon, <laughs> and uh, all the other quarterbacks that were drafted before Russell Wilson uh, in that draft and uh, fail with them just so that I can feel even better about having the best quarterback from that draft. So for the uh, Indianapolis Colts, for making this little moment happen for me, which I'm, I'm kind of enjoying. And then also, too, for Brock Osweiler. Good good for you, man. I hope you're sticking in the league because, you know, again, from our hometown, and I'm always rooting for him, even though it's been, you know, not the best career so far. Uh, better at life than Skip Bayless. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Because, because here's the connection. Brock Osweiler played with Ryan Tannehill last year. Another quarterback drafted ahead of Russell Wilson. Uh-huh. The first round, you know, the number one pick, Andrew Luck. And uh, the, basically the only other quarterbacks out there are Kirk Cousins, who was not drafted ahead of Russell Wilson. And uh, who else from that class is still playing? Nick Foles. Nick Foles. Yeah. But also taken in the fourth round after Russell Wilson. Right. It, with more rings than uh, Andrew oh, wait, Luck no, as no, well. No, he was third round, but he was uh, he was at 88 overall and Russell was right. 75. Right. So it's kind of funny. Um Russell Wilson and Nick Foles, the two third round quarterbacks from that draft, more rings than Andrew Luck. I mean, more Super Bowl appearances, too. I just mm -hmm. funny how that worked out. The world is strange, man. It's hard to predict things. Uh, this this Andrew Luck thing is definitely just uh, taking the entire NFL and kind of turned it on its head a little bit. Well, how about a, an honorary better at life for Andrew Luck? You're making a tough decision. That, that couldn't have been easy. You mentioned oh, the no hate in my heart for the guy. No. Not at all. I mean, you, you talked about a little bit of the, the toughness aspect that, that you think plays into it, but he did go through a lot. He did go through a lot. I'm not discounting that. I'm just saying, like, suck it up a little bit, too. <laughs> sure. Yeah. It's not, like, it's not like you're a coal miner. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you're not, you're not making, you know, 20 bucks an hour. You're, you're, you're making a lot more than that. And 20 bucks an hour is a hell of a wage. I just want to thank Andrew Luck for giving us some conspiracy theory fuel now, because with yep. Oliver Luck running the XFL, mm -hmm. who do you think they're going to be talking about? Oh, ooh, it could be a big splash if Andrew Luck now comes to play in the XFL and really kicks off the league that his dad's running. OK, this was almost my do better because uh, it wasn't just for I hadn't thought about the XFL angle of this and him going there because his dad's the commissioner. Rah, rah. But um, I remember when Barry Sanders retired. And for five straight years, every off season, there's the Barry Sanders should unretire and come back to this team. Barry Sanders could unretire and come back to this team for, for years and years and years. Mm -hmm. And God, we're going to get five years of that with Andrew Luck. Oh yeah. E easy. Yeah. Those are going to be, those are going to be stories that aren't fun. Or it's going to be come back to play in the XFL. No, if he comes back to play, it'll be in the NFL. No, he's got to hook his dad up to to get, really give some juice to, to the, the NFL. Yeah, and give it some legitimacy. Heck yeah! You think this is all planned? Don't you think? <laughs> I mean, I I had a thought about it, but I did. <laughs> wow, I didn't realize we were gonna go tinfoil hat at the end of the uh, <laughs> end of the pod, but here we are. Here, here we are. I'm, I'm saying yeah. it. It floated into my mind a little bit. Interesting. Well, his yeah. dad's running the XFL and they need. No, I'm, I'm not saying you're out of bounds on this. Like I'm starting to connect the dots in my brain. Okay. And like, you know, the only thing that's missing from this is aliens. <laughs> like and somehow they're involved, too. Yeah. And the reptile people get them in there. Mm hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, probably what happens is, is that Oliver Luck, uh, you know, paid somebody to hurt Andrew in practice so that he would go through one more injury and have to retire. And then he gets in Andrew's ear and it's like, look, son, you can come back and you can really hook dad up. Cause you know what I did? I got you to Stanford so that you could be the number one pick and make you a hundred million dollars. You owe me a solid. <laughs> and, uh, and so aliens come from outer space and heal Andrew luck and bring him back to the XFL. Ooh, either that, if the, if the aliens can't heal him, they can, the reptile people can grow a, a new leg 
uh, for Andrew oh. to have it transplanted on. Yeah. yeah. It, which he never reveals in public because it's scaly. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. Andrew Luck's always wearing those knee high socks. You got to wonder is it a reptile you leg? Can, you got to wonder. Yeah. Yeah, Andrew Luck comes. That here it is. You write this headline, people. Andrew Luck returns to football in XFL debut with alligator leg. And with that, there's only one thing left to say: Go Hawks! Go Hawks! <laughs>